From Los Angeles, the home of film and television, this is Film Music Live, a webcast featuring outstanding composers, orchestrators, filmmakers, and more from the world of music for film, television, and video games, talking about their work and answering your questions. Film Music Live is sponsored by the Film Music Network and Film Music Institute. And now the host of Film Music Live, Daniel Schweiger. Hey everyone, my name is Daniel Schweiger and I want to welcome you all to the second episode of Film Music Live at the Film Music Network Facebook page. Mark Northam is producing and I want to thank you all for tuning in today. I'm thrilled to welcome a composer whom I describe as the most rhythmically energetic member of America's first film scoring family, David Newman. A cousin to Randy and an older brother to Tom, David's career started as a session player for any number of great composers before establishing himself as one of Hollywood's most prolific and tunefully fun musicians. His work has ranged from cult favorites like Galaxy Quest, The Sandlot, and Heathers to anti-comedies like Throw Mama from the Train, Jingle All the Way, and Bowfinger, and such symphonically lush works as Hoffa and The Fair of the Necklace. Anyone who's seen David conduct at places like the Hollywood Bowl can attest to the intense delight He's brought to live score performances with a dedication to classic work that now sees him recreating Leonard Bernstein's score for Steven Spielberg's remake of West Side Story. And now, joining us from his home studio, I think a place that everyone is at, is David Newman. Welcome to Film Music Live, David. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Glad to be here. Sorry for my bare studio. I got caught in the middle of a remodel. Uh, it works, but it's not been finished. So that's why the wall looks so bare. So it's FYI. <laughs> I'm sure it will be more prolific. <laughs> now, was film music just something that was in your blood? Were you always destined to do this? Uh, no, uh, I don't think for Tom or Randy or any of us, uh, we led a very nice bucolic upper middle class or up whatever you want to say life in the west side of Los Angeles. We went to public school. We all played sports. We were in theater. Um, I, I, I don't think we were we were really well trained in music, but it was only there was no like I don't think anyone thought they would go into film music, quite frankly. Um, we were we were uh, we were children of my father's third marriage. He was he was he was older. He died in 1970, just before I turned um, 16. So we were pretty young. We were pretty not really understanding what was going on at the at the at the time. So I, I came to it much later uh, when I was in college uh, as to what a genius. He was, and uh, that that appreciation I started to develop then has only increased as I've gotten older and had more experience with lots of different orchestras and doing more films and uh, et cetera. So uh, it 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 was it was actually kind of ideal. There was really no pressure to do anything uh, per se, uh, though we were. We were all studying, you know, we all studied violin and piano from an early age and learned theory and counterpoint and all the things that you learn, what, what, what you would define as studying classical music, but very little discussion or conversation about film music. It, it really wasn't what my father would have wanted to talk about if he wanted to really talk to us at all, you know. So, um, you know, it was a very 50s family, you know, the the. The mom, my mom was home all the time and my dad was kind of absent most of the time, like any good 50s post-World War II family, you know, <laughs> it was the time that they grew up in. It was great though. It was, it, it, I, it was, it was wonderful. We had a wonderful childhood. Uh, I can't, you know, I'm not speaking for Tom, but I'm sure he would say the same thing. Now, tell me about breaking into your first session work. I mean, you played in some classic scores. What was it for you to like be there to watch composers like Goldsmith working? Yeah. Um, well, I had a little bit of a heads up on that, but 
what what happens is when I I, I was on the, the 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 violin track. I was a I was a I got my undergrad in violin performance. And as you know, in an orchestra, there are lots of violins. There's 30 violins. There's only two flute players. So as competitive as it is, it's it, the least competitive is is playing the, the, the violin. And you're not, a, you know, you don't have to be a soloist or, or anything. But when you're growing up, you play in all these orchestras and then you get cat, you know, you get dates, you play, so, you know, at that point you would play for pop songs or you know, whatever church jobs and, and, and you, there's, there's a little group of people that you affiliate yourself with just naturally. And then eventually somebody breaks into film and then you, you kind of break in because you know, somebody that knows somebody that gives you a chance and then you do okay. And you break in. Plus at that time, there was so much work for musicians. I mean, there were five huge contractors at, at when I broke in in 77, I mean, five major contractors. There was probably enough work for six, seven, eight hundred musicians to make a really good living playing studio, uh, film, television, and um, jingles and records in Los Angeles and Hollywood. Now it's completely different. Now you can't do that. Now there's only work for maybe a hand, the 80, 80 musicians. So it's much, much harder to break in now. How would you say you developed your own voice as a composer? Uh, it was really difficult for me, and I don't even know that I've totally solved it now. Um, I don't know why I ended up doing all these comedy scores. It's not my nature, really. Um, as you suggested, um, I have a very energetic, aggressive um, quality to my music but i think it's based on what films i was originally given and then uh my work as a conductor and as a violinist and my aesthetic which i really think was derived from my father um and if any of the people listening are fans of 40s and 50s film scores uh and you watch fox films um you can see how aggressive that style is that my father promulgated. Um, it maybe isn't ostensibly aggressive, ostensibly, but it is really an obsessive style of string dominated playing. Uh, there is a way that they phrase and speak to the film that they learned in the 30s as to how they how, how to score movies that is that is really quite um i don't know if aggressive is the right word but it's it's very out front emotionally in a way um i mean it's more nuanced and complicated than i'm than i'm making it seem but i think just given the 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 zeitgeist at the time um that's it's it's just sort of infiltrated into the projects that I was allowed to score and um, and that's I think that's how I developed it. But I, I honestly composing came to me really late. I never intended to be a composer. Um, I didn't really start composing till I was twenty eight or twenty nine. Um, but my father basically, I mean not maybe not is as much as that but basically he didn't really learn to compose either till he was in his 30s uh, he was born in 1900 he came to uh hollywood in 1930 uh, and really he was a he was a prodigy pianist and a, and a broadway conductor um very high end but that that's how we got to hollywood and when he got to hollywood he thought he was going to be doing music directing for musicals because that's what was popular and when he got here it, it wasn't popular anymore. And so they were doing noirs and dramas and trying to, you know, him and Steiner and Waxman and then Korngold and all of them were trying to figure out what to do. And I think that's how he figured out how to compose because he had to. And it took, you, you can, you can, if you look at his development, um, you can, you can see from 30 to 39, you know, from 
uh, I don't know, uh, what's an early film, Barbary Coast or uh, um, early Alfred Newman films, the, that, that one where um, the guy, Robinson Crusoe, do you know that film, Daniel, um, uh, that, uh, what's his name, the UA uh, actor, I'm blanking on his name, um, hmm. the whole film is, is on an island and he's pretending he's, you know, Robinson Crusoe, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. Oh my God, okay, was. someone... So yeah, I think so. It's right. like 19, so it's like 1932, or maybe it's Douglas Fairbanks. I don't know. And if you look at that score, and then you go to 1939, and he's doing Weathering Heights, and that's of course the year of, of Herbert Stoddard's um, Wizard of Oz, and and Max Steiner is Gone with the Wind, and you know you 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 in in a space of a decade have a have a mature art form that lasted through the late 50s, basically. Um, I don't know. That's a long-winded way of saying I, 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 I think my life never really felt totally comfortable composing, and I don't feel like I, I, I feel like Tom feels much more found his voice early on because it was his. It, it, I don't want to speak for him, but it was his, um, his goal was was to do that to to compose. My goal was to to be a conductor, not not to be a composer. I just realized. By the time I was 29, I was not going to, you know, not only was I not going to be a conductor, I didn't really want to be a conductor once I realized what what it really entailed, the, 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 the job that it really entailed. You know, and when you started out, you were doing some really fun you know, genre scores like Critters, The Kindred. Your first score was with Michael Confrontino for Frankenweenie. Uh, you did yeah. a wonderful animated film called The Brave Little Toaster. But yeah. really, you could say the score that put you over the top and began a wonderful collaboration with Danny DeVito was Throw Mama from the yeah. Train, which is this really great, yeah. rollicking Hitchcock pastiche, uh, which led you to War of the Roses among your many films. Yeah. And, you know, the Hoffa, which uh, you could definitely say is your symphonic masterwork that uh, La La Land Records just put out. What, what has that collaboration yeah. been like and just going through all these different kind of styles? Well, I mean, I really learned how to write such as it is, how to write film music on Throw Mom from the Train because um, my initial, I, I got that film because he loved the music to Critters. And if you, I, I, you'd have to see the film, but there is, there is not a more bizarre score that you could temp a movie like Throw Mama from the Train was with the music from Critters. I, I it, it absolutely baffled me what he saw in that. Um, but I think he liked the crazy energy of Critters. Um, which, I mean, what am I going to do in a film like Critters? I mean, I, it's, it's funny, loony. It, you know, it's like a Bugs Bunny score for a horror film. You know, I, 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 I I'm not, sure what else I would have done with that film, except, but it just was such a weird thing. But that's how I got um, Throw Mama. And nobody wanted me on that film but him. So that was Orion. They definitely tried to get me off that movie. But him being who he is, the, the more you would fight with him, the more he would say, you know, F blah, 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 K, U, uh, to my, to, 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 obviously to my advantage. but. I wrote, a, I wrote, a, the, the, the main title is Billy Crystal having writer's block with all these jump cuts. And when you look at it without music, it's, it's funny, you know, but it's still, it's a, it's a Hitchcock pastiche. It's, it, it's, it's referencing strangers on a train, right? Isn't that what it's referencing? Am I right, Daniel? Chris, crisscross strangers on the train, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I wrote, a, go ahead. Oh, I'm saying you're saying you wrote, I apologize. We have a time delay here a little bit. Yeah. I, uh, I wrote a main title. So this is very early on for me. So I'm not really very, very experienced. And I wrote a main title and it took him about two days to decide he didn't really like it, but he didn't really know why he didn't like it. And so this is a very common thing. I just didn't know that it was common at the time. So I kind of freaked out 
and I tried to talk to him about it, but I didn't know at the time all that much you really can't talk about music with a director. It just doesn't really resonate with them um, it, it, in terms of getting information about how best to score their film. But, you know, I learned, I listened, you know, and so I got it, I, I figured, okay, it, it's making the scene not funny. It's not funny somehow. I'm not allowing the scene to be funny. So I started over and the great thing about composing music is however terrified you are, and it is, believe me, it is terrifying doing it. First of all, because it's so much fun and you want to keep doing it. And you don't want to get fired and you don't want people to hate what you do. But eventually you start writing and you just get, it just gets interesting. You know, you're listening. Billy Crystal is saying, he keeps saying the night was, and he, so he's true. trying to start. <laughs> yeah. Well, at the, at the, when she figures it out at the end, but right. <laughs> which is the climax of the movie, but he can't, he cannot figure it out. He has, he has writer's block. So, and then he keeps, you know, one scene, he's sharpening his pencil in a jump cuts. And he's like doing this on a typewriter, like just with one and he's pulling paper out and he's crumpling, you know, jump cut, jump cut, jump cut. And so I started writing something that was a little more circusy, cartoony, but still had all the Bernard Herman esque dark things. And I would go back and forth and I lightened it up a bit to where it allowed it to be funny it doesn't it didn't make it funny it allowed it to be funny now danny just loved it it like completely cemented my relationship with him because he thought my god i went from this oppressive main title to something that didn't work at all that now made the scene sparkle but then there were people at orion saying like begging me to rewrite the main title because it wasn't funny enough it, it 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 was too serious you know they didn't like the bernard herman stuff in it um but danny just loved it and so honestly that it, it, it taught me that you can fix stuff in a movie a movie is all about fixing stuff you you shoot it you cut it together and you start editing which is essentially just fixing it figuring out what it is. And music is the same thing. It comes later and you write it and you put it up in front of the movie and it works or it doesn't work. And then it's a process of just fixing it to make it work. And I did learn that. I don't know that I found my voice because I thought Danny's movies were so, uh, uh, just were so uh, allowed more of my aesthetic as I was, discussing to come through, I could be, I don't know, the word's not bigger. I could like be more aggressive in what I was doing and it would work because the movie was, the movies are so lush and operatic and larger than life and have weird points of view, POV shots and a, a, a allow, you know, you don't have to be quite as careful to back away. And so now, that, I have to that, say probably that... go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Again, we're dealing with it. We're figuring out the time <laughs> delay. Um, I, I have to say that my personal favorite is throw is uh, War of the Roses. And they're two of my favorite things you've ever done. Uh, segwaying from the Fox logo to the waltzing main title. And I mean, I have a dog and a cat and there's something just funny about watching pets getting killed in movies. I don't know what it is, Fish Called Wanda. But the cue you wrote in War of the Roses where Michael Douglas storms out of the house and backs over the cat is just, I laugh hysterically every time. I know, just hear the music. And again, you, you, you're literally like Carl Stalling. Like if Carl Stalling wrote feature scores, that's really, I think for me, what a lot of your comedy work is like. Yeah, I mean, it it is and it it is and it isn't. I know it's texturally like again, Daniel. It's it's just weird. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't come to the, this composing from I wanted to, I wanted to be a composer. I don't I don't have that kind of skin in the game. 
I love, I feel like I'm more of a, a film person. I, I love movies. I love collaborating with people, but I also love collaborating with a medium. I mean, I know you know this too, Daniel, from all your music editing work. When you look at something over and over and over again, you, you, you bond to the thing itself. You know, you're not, you're bonding to a movie, not the people that made the movie necessarily, though, of course, you have to deal with them too. But there's this wonderful relationship you develop with the movie itself, and you try to the best of your ability to give it what it needs. And hopefully you've been cast, a hired cast, to score a, a movie that is simpatico with your aesthetic and that you bring that to the movie and it helps the, 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 the movie. So I, it, to me, I, 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 I just try to give it like what I think it, it needs. Um, like War of the Roses has all this pathos in it too. Um, and it's like, it's like, it's, you know, a divorce to the death. It's, and it's, it's Shakespearean. It's, it's, it, it's almost like Macbeth. Um, uh, you know, when you get to the, you get to the last act of the movie, it's about as dark as you can get, but it still needs to be funny, you know? And so there's only so, there's only so many ways to be dark without being oppressive and low and brooding and, and things that you can do in a drama or a horror film or, uh, you know, there's a there's a lot of syntax for that. There isn't as much syntax for this for this, these kinds of dark comedy. I don't know if that makes sense. What what is the oh, genre the food genre you're drawing on? You know, you have to sort of make it up a little bit. Now you scored so many cult movies, especially during the '80s. You know, Bill and Ted, Heather's, Meet the Applegates, one of my favorites. Um, but I think if there are two certifiable cult movies that people would be happy to be stuck on a desert island with, uh, it's Galaxy Quest and The Sailor. Yeah. And well, now there's a wonderful Gal Galaxy. No go. Oh, there. I'm sorry. There's a wonderful Galaxy Quest documentary that you're in on uh, Amazon uh, called Never Surrender, you know, and again, just it really it captures Star Trek while being its own thing. And again, the Sandlot has such a wonderful sense of nostalgia, but they both, again, really appeal to, you know, youthful audiences just who just love this stuff. Yeah, I mean, Ga Galaxy Quest was just a miracle. I mean, Galaxy Quest is a movie that the studio had nothing to do with. They stopped giving notes. They, of course, didn't market it. If you watch the, um, if you watch the uh, documentary, but that's a movie that Dean, Dean Pariseau, the director, Don Zimmerman, the fucking oh, excuse me, I shouldn't say that, the <laughs> awesome editor of you know the Hal, he did all those Hal Ashby films, which I adore those films. Um, uh, 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 Jeff Carson, the music editor that worked with Don, and then me it, involved in post-production. We just did it ourselves. No, nobody, nobody was there. We just did it ourselves. They, 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 as you'll see in the document, if you watch the documentary, which is great, uh, they did a horrible test screening with seven and eight year olds where the, the mothers were screaming at Dean and Don and the, you know, they, they couldn't get out of there fast enough. And then the studio just sort of threw up their hands and said, okay, make the movie. Um, so that is a movie truly made by, um, without any interference from a studio. And because no, because they, they could not understand what the movie was about. Bill, Bill and Ted was a, a bit like that too, though, though there was more interference. Nobody understood that movie except Steve Herrick and, you know, the editor and and us. I mean, we understood the movie, but the film studio, be, like Bill and Ted, when you read the script, read like a Harvard, like a Harvard, what's the comedy Harvard uh, Lamp entity that they, that, oh, yeah, it, it read like a really sophisticated lampoon sketch, but that's not what it was. 
And when you actually filmed it, when you filmed the script, which was filmed, that's not what the movie was. The movie was about these two goofy, doofus, good-hearted guys that were in love. You know, it was a bromance or an early bromance. And that that's a, was another lesson in when you read a script, which is what, what pre-production is about, is reading a script, lo, casting and doing locations and budgeting, you know, but shoot the movie. And sometimes it's a 180. It isn't what, and you're shooting the script, you're, you're doing it, but it's, it, it doesn't compute. And so that was another example, I think, of, of something that w was, I, I really learned a lot about, you know, how movies, how movies are made. And, and Sandlot was just a lovely experience, though it was a very, 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 very low budget and very difficult um, uh, logistically to do, though we did end up doing unions. It was a whole thing. We did end up doing a whole lot more recording than we originally intended once they saw the movie. Fox saw, that was Fox, I think, right? Yeah, Fox. How is it for you to do kind of more adult, much more lushly symphonic work like Hoffa, Affair of the Necklace, stuff that you know, people wouldn't really I, was, wouldn't think was in your wheelhouse at the time? Well, I, I'm, as I said, I mean, I, I, I love it. It's actually much easier to do. It's, 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 it's the, the music's dubbed louder in the, in the film. It's, it's the, you're not, you're not dealing with, with comedy problems that are, you know, texture genre problems. Um, you, 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 it's, I find it much easier to do. Uh, and, and as I said, Daniel, I, I'm like a trained musician. I, I can do any style. I, this, you know, Hollywood does this. It's fine. I don't, I don't mind it, but, um, it, it's, you know, I, I love doing other stuff, but again, I don't, I don't care that much. I mean, it's not like, oh, I have to do a drama or I have to do, you know, a thriller or noir or what, you know, what, whatever. Um, I just, I, but my main thing is I want to work with people that are great artists or good artists and care about it and care about the, 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 the art form. But honestly, I find it much easier doing those. Hoffa was much easier than War of the Roses. War of the Roses was really difficult to figure out. Hoffa was, now, I don't know that I figured out Hoffa all that well because there's a, there's a little bit of a timing thing with Hoffa. It, it was a little bit before you could have an anti-hero like that really play uh it, it it didn't do very well and i think it was a little the timing was a little it would have been it would have been better if it came out uh, you know 10 15 years later i think at the time because it really was like when an anti-hero film or a tv show would be now where you know there's so there's so much hero anti-hero kind of uh uh content so I don't know if I exacerbated that prob a problem by making the Hoffa character um, seem heroic, which I definitely did, which maybe I shouldn't have done. I don't know. Now, when it comes to working with other people, you have a whole other thing going on, which is uh, doing live to picture film music performances. You, know, you work with the American Youth Orchestra. Uh, you've done amazing uh you know, like It's a Wonderful Life, uh, all the incredible Hollywood Bowl performances. And now uh, one of one of the really magical nights is watching you do well, Leonard Bernstein's underscore for West Side Story. Uh, yeah. And now you're working on the uh, new Steven Spielberg from adapting uh, yeah. for that. What, what's that like, you know, just bringing this old music back to life again? Yeah, I again, I have no idea how this happened. I mean, the in 2011, we I premiered at the Hollywood Bowl the 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 West Side Story film with with live orchestra and I've probably done it fifty times since then. Um, I did West Side Story in my twenties. I used to uh, be involved in a kind of semi pro theater company, uh, and meaning that you know we'd have, we had a union orchestra, so we had a good orchestra and stuff. 
And I remember doing West Side Story in high school. I was a rehearsal pianist for three months, and and now I'm involved in the in the in the Spielberg remake. Um, and um, unfortunately, you know, we were almost done, and we got we got stopped by the this virus. Uh, so I don't know when we're gonna when when we're gonna finish it, but I've been working on it for the better part of a year, um, mainly just supervising the orchestrations a bit there's a there's a lot of different uh ways it's been orchestrated uh in it's a movie so there's various things that need to be done but being very very careful and working with the Leonard Bernstein office uh to be really really uh to 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 not veer too much off from Bernstein's vision um uh it's been a it's been I've never done anything like this um uh but it's been a it's been a joy it's a it's a very young cast um it's absolutely gorgeous looking um it's 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 lovely i just wish we could have finished it <laughs> <laughs> well um so thanks to la la land records uh, we've got uh, uh, co five copies of Hoff and five copies of the Sandlot to give away for our first 10 questions in the United States because that's where I'll be mailing it to. Um, so anyone asking a question in our first 10 people, just uh, I am me on Facebook and uh, send me your address and your name and I'll get uh, your CDs off to you. So uh, please uh, start sending questions. Our producer, Mark Northam, is going to be feeding them to me through Facebook, so I will be looking uh, down below. Um, so as we're, as we're waiting to, uh, to get one, um, tell me, uh, let, let's go to, uh, Heather's, which again, another, another call, again, the really wonderful harmonica score, again, infinitely quotable film that again, really kind of put you on the cult map. Uh, and we'll be getting questions, uh, while you answer. Sure. Uh, yeah, Heather's, I, um, Heather's was early on. I remember I was working at Sundance. Uh, I ran the composer's lab for three years, I think 88, 89 and 90 maybe, or 80, I don't, I don't know what the years were. Um, but Heather's was a, is, a, is a really incredible movie that I think really holds up. And I think portended a lots of, of these kinds of uh, dialogue, slangy uh, comedies. Um, uh, and it was all electronic, but like really early. Um, I wish some of it was a little, I wish it had been a little later with the gear being a little bit better, but we were all working with what what we had to work with. Um, I, that was another movie that uh, very little uh, input from the studio. Nobody really under, understood uh, what it was. That was Michael Lehman, who was just brilliant still brilliant um and then after that i you know i did that daniel you mentioned meet the apple gates which was a, yeah, a little a, a different sort of crazy yeah crazy film that i don't know that it got much traction i think it's it's a wonderful film if you've never seen it it's just nuts uh, really crazy but heartfelt but heathers i think was something really special i think the language in heathers was extraordinary uh, that dan waters the screenwriter uh, just hit it out of the park. Uh, um, uh, I hope the score lived up to that. How great the the the, the script was in the in the, in the film. I'm, I'm not. I actually haven't watched it in a while. Um, I still. It's still a little hard for me because of the 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 sound, the technology. I think I did it all on an eight track with a Roland uh, D50 and. Uh, S50, which was an early Roland sampler, you know, it was like eight tracks. It was really hard to do. Um, I did some of it at Sundance where we had a big studio, but mostly I did it at home and mixed it at home. So. So here's a question from Louie. What was your favorite <clears throat> and most challenging score to compose? I think Serenity, the Joss Whedon film. Um, uh, I'm surprised I didn't get fired on that film. Uh, I wrote, if you're familiar with the movie, the character River, uh, they're all characters from uh, Firefly, but um, which I consciously did not watch till after the movies. I don't want to get, but you know, it still ends up being Western. 
um, I had written her theme, River's theme, and that had um, that had Joss we liked that theme. But then I started trying to write the main title theme, which was like a, a main title that gets interrupted, uh, which it does in the end too. And I think I had to do 15 or 16 versions. I could not, I just could not solve it. And eventually I solved it because he let me keep going and I figured it out. But I, I literally, um, I literally could not, I, 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 I don't know why he didn't fire me. And the other one, was the Tom Shadiak directed um, Nutty Professor, the original one. There was a scene in it um, that is when he's, uh, he, I, I, I see near the end where he's saying, you know, just be yourself. It's like an emo, you know, emotional scene in a movie like that. And I remember Tom and Jeff Carson and Don Zimmerman, again, from Galaxy Quest, they came over and I just, I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And he didn't like it, didn't like it, didn't like it, didn't like it, didn't like it. And then he said he liked one, like three bars of it. And then I finally figured out what he was talking about. So then I wrote it and then he liked it. But it was really hard to figure out. But once I figured those things out and the rest of the, both those movies went relatively, relatively easy. And I've been thrown off a couple of films too, which I just did not, I couldn't, I couldn't solve it. You know, sometimes films, you, you, you can't solve it, or there's some other reason that you're on a film, but somebody doesn't want you to be on the film and you get sabotaged and stuff like that. But all in all, it's been wonderful. I've been really lucky and it's been a, it's been a great uh, experience for me. So Joshua, can't wait to hear what you're going to do for West Side Story. And he's wondering, uh, in the last yeah. 20 years, uh, what are some of the scores that you've heard that you love? <laughs> it's a long, it's a I'm bit not, of a time spin. But yeah, like I'm not, I'm not really that great at this. I wouldn't, I, I know a lot more about 70s and before scores or 80s scores. Um, I was fascinated for a while about the difference between Goldsmith and John Williams, who really were hegemonic in the latter half of the 20th century in film music, at least up, up until Elfman and Hans Zimmer kind of, you know, took over whenever that was, that, that kind of slow um, development. I was really fascinated by where they both came from, which was polar opposite um, beginnings where John was more of a band. Um, not They were both, of course, expertly trained. Um, and by the way, a lot of Fox training, a lot of training at Fox, at 20th Century Fox, which was a great training ground for a lot of them. But I was really interested in, John came from a more populist place and Jerry came from a much more avant-garde place. And then they just both kind of went to the center and in, in their different ways. And, um, you know, there's scores of Goldsmith that I just think are absolutely otherworldly. I, I mean, I think Planet of the Apes is one of the greatest scores of all time, but I also like, I think Spartacus is one of the, is, is, is perhaps one of the greatest scores of the 20th century in its, in its own way. And I, and I think E.T. and Star Wars, and I mean, all, all that John Williams work is you know arguably the most influential film composer you know he's uh, he's obviously the most influential film composer that ever lived um at, 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 as as recently um I, I i i i just don't feel like i have enough um distance from it it's not the way my brain works i don't like th there's lots of things I, I watch lots and lots of television, um, uh, contemporary television. I hear a lot of interesting things. Most of it isn't interesting, but a lot of it is interesting. Um, uh, I, I'm interested in what I, I, I know that for television, because I now I'm doing a little bit. You 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 get way less money and have way less resources i wonder what it would be like if there was more if it was more like a film paradigm um 
I don't know. I wish there was more like relationships like Zemeckis and Alan Silvestri and John and uh, Spielberg and, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's there, there, there isn't as much. I mean, there, there is, I mean, there's Nolan and, and, and Hans and everything, I, I, you know, but I, I'm, I, I'm, I, I, I'm not a really good student of that, to be quite frank. So I'm not, I'm not utterly thrilled with what's going on now, but that doesn't mean anything. It's just my, it's my age and my, um, my uh, experience, you know. So now here's a question from, now here's a question from James. Uh, again, you started off with the wonderful Brave Little Toaster. You've scored DuckTales. Rover Dangerfield. Now you've done uh, Green Eggs and Ham for Netflix. What's your approach to scoring animation? Not really any different, except maybe you can be a little wilder. Uh, what I was talking about with uh, DeVito movies, uh, it's a, it's you have to be quicker on your feet a little bit. It depends on the animation. Um, these Green Eggs and Ham's very sophisticated. Uh, it's as was Brave Little Toaster, as as most of the, as was the Ice Age, most of them that I've Anastasia, they're 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 kind of, um, they're they're more feature film, uh, in concept than they are animated. I I I would I, I look at them more as movies than 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 animation. Though of course they're animated, and there's a lot of, um, you know Dan, as you were saying, Carl, there's a lot of referencing old cartoons uh, just you know i mean some of that music was freaking genius um though it di it didn't it didn't have much pathos and it didn't have much it, it wasn't necessarily all that filmic um I, I i generally view it just as a film um is the way so i love i love animation i love the care that they take the creators with it um this green eggs and ham, I could just, I watch, I, 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 it is so sophisticated now. It looks like hand-drawn on, on animation. It's not, but what they can do now with character, it's extraordinary. There's a, there's a, there's a scene in the first episode. There's like a seven minute dialogue scene in a tree house. That is, uh, it's just them talking for seven minutes. It, 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 it basically sets up the last, three, four episodes. It's just a dialogue scene for seven minutes that I scored the whole thing. I, I mean, that's not really all that animated, is it? I mean, it, 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 you know, that them sort of bearing their soul because of the situation that they're in and the, a lot of facial expressions, they're not talking the whole time. They're, they're looking, the camera's cutting back and forth as you would in any dialogue scene. And, um, you know, animation. You you also have to be careful. Um, there, there it, it's it's a little less obviously genre. I mean, there are genres to pull from, but um, I don't know. What do you do with a seven minute dialogue scene in an animated movie, or you know, or like in Ice Age, the scene where he's looking at the at the uh, cave drawings. You know what? How do you pull from that? You know what's what's that? I, I, you, you have to figure it out and it has to make sense in what you've come from, you know, what you come from and where you're going. So, and it's, it's not always easy to figure out and you're not always right. And you hope they dub it right. You can get killed <laughs> by dubbing as Daniel, you can, you'll probably have many experiences to over the, the course of this, this, these things, these podcasts that you're doing, to explain how extraordinarily important it is your experience of music by how loud or soft it is and how good the engineers that are mixing the dialogue and the effects and everything together, how sensitive they are to what the hell music's doing there in the first place. If they don't turn it down in a comedy so you can't hear it and they don't make it too loud so that it's oppressive and that it isn't static. It isn't just sitting at some level that it's being uh, moved around. If you watch John Williams um, Spielberg films, they are expertly dubbed. The music, the, the music is being used 
exactly for the reason it was written. That's what you want in a, in a, in a dub. And the reason mainly it's not generally done as expertly is because they're going for weeks and weeks, which Daniel Schweiger can explain this better than me, but uh, <laughs> they're going week and week during effects and dialogue over and over and over. And then the final where it's, where it's everything together is a much shorter amount of time and there's a much closer deadline and they have to get through much more as fast as they can generally. So they don't have time to go over and over and over and over. And then it's finishing and everybody's freaking out and they're all unobjective about it and they're sick of it. And, and the time when they should be the freshest and most um, sitting back, relaxing, taking it in as a first time audience is they're 180 degrees away from that. So it's very difficult to dub a movie, especially a comedy. Now, That's my Andres opinion. is a big, oh, sure. Now, Andres is a, a big fan of your Ice Age score, and he's a particular fan of one of my personal favorite scores and movies that you've done, which is The Phantom. Uh, tell, tell us about working yeah. on that. The Phantom was a nightmare um, because there was so much music and it was so late. We 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 uh, scored in London, so there was a there was a there was a brick wall deadline, and the movie got pushed back and back and back and back and back. And I remember remember Daniel, we used to get everything on VHS, every reel when they would re-edit, you get a new VHS tape reel. And so I had ninety. It, 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 there was. I think it was in, on seven reels and I had 90 tapes, 90 VHS tapes. And it became a nightmare to figure out like what edit and cut I was doing. And I had hired a guy at the time and he wrote me, he was one of these, uh, like an assistant that wrote me a, a Excel spreadsheet to figure out like what the hell was, was going on. And we, numbered all the tapes it, it, it we i never even finished it i i we had to come back and and do the last 20 minutes of music you know kind of on an is of isd in line we didn't go back but we had to do we had to do another full session just to finish it but i i loved i loved the movie and i loved um scoring it and and, and i loved working um with um with um uh and i'm blanking on his name the director um, Simon Winsor yeah Simon because I had done that operation Dumbo drop which I loved working on Unfort that's an unfortunate title actually to a movie though it's a lovely it's a lovely movie um so this had been a year this was sort of a year later and it was still I think with the Phantom was paramount right yeah so I don't know it was um but I like it turned out really good I mean the music turned out good there was just a lot of it now, Tor is a big fan of a lot of your horror scores, which of course I am, particularly the Runestone, which finally Robin uh, yeah. Esterhammer produced a CD, which took years to get out. You actually appear as an ill-fated policeman in that movie. Yeah. Would you like yeah. to return to the horror genre? Um, I loved I loved the horror movies I did. I mean, I, I don't know if you define Critters as a horror movie. Runestone's a real horror movie, uh, uh, right? What else have I done that's horror? I uh, Vendetta uh, uh, was Vendetta. Yeah, Vendetta was a horror movie too. The Kindred. Um, I'm sorry. The Kindred was a horror horror movie. Yeah. Right. That's the one that. Um, do you remember a music a film music critic named Paige Cook that wrote yes. for? I was try he wrote a review of The Kindred that was as if it was like Wagner. I mean, <laughs> don't get me wrong. I liked the score for The Kindred, but it was written in a, like, as fast as I could write. I, I mean, I didn't, even, I didn't even know what I wrote for The Kindred, and we just re recorded it. And he wrote this incredible review that, the, that it was one of the greatest things. And, and then I did a movie called Malone, a Burt a, a Reynolds movie that was kind of a B Burt Reynolds movie. 
And then he wrote the scathing review about how horrible the music was for Malone. And he was a huge fan of my father and had written a lot of, he was an old time guy. And I was trying to find that review and I couldn't find it anywhere. Phil, it was, it was a magazine called Films and Review. I don't know if you know yeah. anything about it, but I'd love to see that review again. I, I, I love horror films. It, and again, they're not as, they're not to do, they're fun. You, 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 there's a lot to draw from, you know, it's, it, it's structure. There's a certain structure to them ma mainly. And, and then you could, or you can be really off the wall with it and, and do all kinds of stuff. Um, I don't know. I, 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 you know, I, you, you can do interesting stuff with it. So crit critters, I don't know. Would you define critters as a horror movie? A horror comedy. Yeah. Is there, are there a lot now, of horror comedies? I think they're probably more now than there ever have been, you know, yeah. I mean, everything's got like, you know, a, a sense of black humor about it. Here, here's a question from Liz, who would love you to talk about your efforts to protect and preserve old film scores. Yeah. Um, well, we started that at Sundance in the late eighties. And I don't know, Daniel, if you came to the concert at Royce Hall, which I think was in 1988, where all those movie stars, did you go to that? Where all the movie stars were there and Redford was there and Charlton Heston and Mancini and George yeah. Delarue and you met, yeah. and, and, and remember Alex North right before he died was there and we did the main title for um, Spartacus with the film, with the original orchestration, which was maybe 120 people on stage. Um, and Alex, I don't know if you remember this, but we didn't know he was gonna come, so we didn't announce him, but then we, I, I knew before I went out that he was gonna be there. So after we finished the main title, which I don't know, it's about three and a half minutes, four minutes, with the beautiful Saul Bass titles, I turned around and it was, it was like an Academy Award A-list audience. I mean, it, it was like, because of, because of Redford, uh, it, you know, Catherine Deneuve was there, Christopher Reeve was there, Charlton Heston was there, and Mancini, and Delarue, and Maurice Jarre, and they were all, you know, like everybody was conducting their own stuff. And then I was conducting stuff with film and, you know, with, and it, there were all these speeches and it, it was, it was much more akin to an Academy Award. And so I turned around after Spartacus and asked Alex North to stand up and the place went crazy. They started standing up and cheering and, 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 and I, he, he started to like tear up, you know, and nobody knew if he was even going to, going to come. And for a film composer at that time, they're never, in front of an audience almost ever. You know, it, it, it must have been overwhelming for him. And I don't know, I was working with Tom Wilhite and Willard Carroll, who used to run Disney before, a couple of regimes before um, Eisner got there and, and the thing changed. And Willard Carroll was really into film music and I was really into film music and we just started like doing this. And we did this film music preservation program at Sundance and the board got behind it and they put some money behind it. So we restored a bunch of stuff and, you know, we tried to like get it going. And then it got shut down after it got, you know, we did about seven or eight concerts. The last one was at the Hollywood bowl. There were all these kind of concerts with all these movie stars and, and, um, and then I think Redford, you know, it just got, it got out of, it got a little out of control. We did one at Avery Fisher Hall, like one winter. And we, I think we raised close to a million dollars in one night for the, the Sundance organization. <laughs> and, and then eventually just read, we got, they got tired of it and they just stopped it. But I always was, you know, we, it's always something I've been interested in because it's so hard to find the music to to perform it live and really uh, quite frankly the only reason what's going on now with live film music is john williams at the boston pops in the 80s i mean john john williams basically single-handedly butchered chiseled that music into the repertoire 
No one would have ever done it. He he did it on PBS. You know, all that year after year after year, arguing with them, make, making them play, trying to get them to understand what film music was because they were so awful about it. The arts organizations still have issues with it, but of course not nearly, and they can not nearly what they used to. And of course they can see the love that audiences have for this. The reason it's full yeah. movies now is because it's the easiest way to rent them. It, it, you, 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 can't, you can't show, if you show clips from seven different movies, you're theoretically supposed to rent seven movies to pay the SAG and all that. So it's just, right, that's why it's just easier you rent the movie like uh, from a producer and you pay the money and they you get the movie and you get all the parts and you get everything and you hire your conductor and you do the thing. That That's essentially why it's the way it is now. Now as a composer, you know, I, I really can't think of a few composers at home just wonderfully using a symphony orchestra. But now with essentially what they call the new normal, how, how do you, perceive orchestras going forward or how do you think they can go forward i don't know i have no idea i mean there are orchestras which will get together but i i i literally have no idea what what they're going to do an orchestra is a very old coded institution um you it's very hard to play without sitting where you're used to sitting and listening to your colleagues and um of course you can do it but it's um, I, I, I don't know. It, it just depends what happens. You know, if we had a competent, uh, well, not to get into politics, yeah. but you know, th right. this could have been handled much better. It, it wouldn't have disrupted our lives as, as, as much. Yeah, we're, it's dangerous. It, the pandemic is a pandemic is a pandemic, but our reaction to the pandemic, I think has been abysmal. And I think it could, I think it could have been, you know, once once we learn more about it, may, maybe it isn't so. You know, maybe there are precautions that we can take to to where an orchestra could get together and and and, and do stuff. You know, and it depends on your age and your condition. You know, obviously it it does affect older people and and people with high blood pressure and overweight and and you know. But I don't know. I'm I'm not very and optimistic it, about this. To be Frank, I know you're not, Daniel. You're about the biggest. I mean, I mean, four four more years of this, I would be an absolute absolute disaster. And I don't mean no, that boy, figuratively. Go. I mean that literally. That would literally be um, either unless he unless they stepped up and started uh, work. Anyway, let's not get into this. So, okay. Right, exactly. You can read about we'll, we'll have John Facebook Williams. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. you can read plenty of that. <laughs> but this kind of goes to a, uh, our last question, uh, which is from Joe. Do you think this is going to result conversely in a lot of innovation in terms of film music and people, composers taking completely fresh new approaches to get the sonic idea of what they're after out there? How, how could anything be more a Okay, I'll, I'll give you an example. I am watching now The Watchmen, which I have not watched. So that's Atticus oh, yeah. Ross and, um, okay. So he's scoring it with a, a lot of it's with a sort of out of tune, upright piano. And if that's, I, I, it, it is a fresh approach, but it isn't a fresh approach. It's like a fresh approach is not a fresh approach. It, it, it It's almost like, Scoring something symphonically like that would be a fresh approach, not doing that. So when you're locked up, all you can do is do your sample stuff or small stuff, you know, um, which is what it, it's a lot of what they did in the 60s after as, as, a, as a response to um, the 50s golden age genre you know, Mancini and Alex North and Elmer Bernstein, you know, they started using smaller groups and, and then, that, and then that becomes the norm. So the, 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 whatever, whatever is fresh becomes eventually repetitive. And then it, and then it's the norm and, and it, the norm can even be just as out there as you can be. 
you know, score, score, um, like, like how, how, um, Chernobyl was scored or how the Joker was scored. It, now that's the norm. So it, 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 it you, you, the, I, I, this is a more philosophical conversation. And obviously there are, there are exceptions to this. Um, but generally music develops from a construct that then can be developed and moved along in different ways. Um, if you're so off the wall, it, 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 either it's so off the wall, there's nowhere else to go, or you're in a genre like pop music, like the Beatles. So I would, I would, I would contend that the Beatles took pop music about as far as it could go. And there just wasn't enough, um, brain power training or desire to take what they did and develop it. So I would, I would say it, what the Beatles did would be akin to what Johann Sebastian Bach did in the Baroque era, which would be approximately from 1650 to 1750. He died in 1750. So that's about a hundred years of a certain genre of music. He took that music that slowly developed and made it he made it international. He used every extant form, French dance music, English dance music, wedding music, religious music, motets, whatever you know, all these Baroque forms of music and smashed it into these pieces that he did at the end of life. The Beatles took everything that was around at the time, including a lot of world music and African music and uh, Indian music and classical music and in, in uh, modern classical music, smashed it into these albums. However, they did it. I mean, by God love them. I don't know how they did it, but it all sounds like the Beatles. It sounds like pop music. And I think that film music has something similar to this. I think we're in a little bit of an era now, which is hard to, you would say, they would say a hundred years ago, it's a little bit corrupt. It, it needs to be reformed a bit. I don't know what that means because we're in the middle of it. And this is just me taking a more broad view about what film music is, the, the crisis it's in now. And it's not film. I mean, film is in a major existential crisis. As good as, or as much as you might like Marvel movies, it isn't a good recipe for a diverse, middle-class, you know, independent film, large, uh, you know, supported film environment. It, 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 is a, it is an environment for a certain segment of, anyway, and, and again, this is my opinion, and I don't know, I come from where I come from, I who, I'm, but I'm trying to take a large point of view. It does, like TV now seems to be in a golden era where they are developing, that, you know, not everything is great, but they're, they're, you can see how they are building on, on, on what's come before um, in a kind of interesting way. The problem with television is you, it's a huge commitment of time and you have to watch it all. Uh, I watch it while I'm treadmilling. So I don't care if something gets boring. I just keep watching it unless it's so horribly boring. I don't watch it, but I find lots of times shows I didn't like get better and better. And, and then something miraculous happens. There's like a miraculous episode of something that I never would have seen and it never would have been miraculous had I not stuck with it. So that, that's a little bit of a, 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 an issue. Anyway, that's a long way of saying my, that's my opinion on where actual film music is right now. I think, I think it's stuck, but I don't think it's necessarily the fault of film music as, as, as much as it's the crisis that film itself is in and what film is going to be, what is, Film if you can't go to a movie theater and see it with other people. I don't know. 
So no. back in terms of spending quite a few hours, I think my wrap up question is, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of people have been doing their, uh, their stay in doing different things. I've been trying to get through God of war. Uh, and you've told me you, you've taken actually a truly daunting and terrifying challenge that I, I, I'm too afraid to do it. I know lots of people dream of doing it, but they just, they just can't face it. But you're actually trying to catalog your uh, CD and DVD collection. I am. I, it, it appeals to my OCD-ness. I, I, um, I, have, I have a couple of thousand, you know, I have a lifetime of collecting classical music. So I have a lot of full scores. Um, and I, they were all over my house. I didn't know what I had. So, uh, I started it. Um, I, you can use a, I have a program with a scanner with my iPhone and it, and there's a huge database of this stuff now. So a lot of it's fairly uh, easy now, but, um, it appeals to me and, um, I see what I've got. I remember pieces. I've been doing it with my Blu-rays and my DVDs and I have a lot of music books, you know, reference books. I'm mostly doing it with my reference books. So I have a kind of library for myself and my kids, uh, you know, once I'm not around. So, yep, it appeals to my OCD. <laughs> well, I, I, th I think we both have it. David, I just want to thank you so much for joining us at yeah. Film Music Live. Thanks for uh, being here. Uh, thanks for everyone for watching. On on uh, Monday, June 1st, we are going to be joined by Carter Burwell Live, who is going to be talking about the very funny Netflix series Space Force. So be here on Monday uh, time, TBD. David, send you good vibes. Uh, thanks to our right. producer, Mark Northam, and we will be seeing you all very soon at Film Music Live. Stay, stay healthy. Great vibes to everybody. You too.